Well, the kids are dismissed. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I think sometimes, even with kids, absence makes the heart grow fonder, doesn't it? So it's, <laughs> there's something about that. All right, would you guys just bow with me really quickly? I just want to invite the presence of the Lord into this moment. So Jesus, we ask you right now that you would come, and by your Spirit, Lord, that you would uh, open up this word to us, Lord. We give you permission to come and to uh, minister to us, and Lord, uh, we yield to what it is that you have to say to us today. In Jesus' name, amen. We're continuing in our series about the culture of Christ and trying to understand how it is as Christians, as believers, that our lives are supposed to be different. Because how many of you understand that as Christians, our lives are supposed to be different? And they're different because they should reflect who Jesus was the things that he taught us, the examples that he uh, gave us. And so we want to learn how to become more and more like him in all that we do. And so a part of that, and I guess it's just the way that we put it for this uh, series, is that we want to get his culture, the way that he lived, the way that he wanted us to live. We want to get that into our spiritual DNA so that we might live in a way that glorifies him, but is a witness and a testimony of the good things about Jesus, right? And so we've been talking about all kinds of different things, but this morning I want to talk to us specifically, and the the, the sermon topic today is striving for purity. And this is an area that I believe that is as a, a church in our culture that we've sort of gotten a little bit maybe lackadaisical about, but it's something I think that God desires from us is to live a pure life, and we're talking about morally before Him. And there's reasons why we want to be able to do that. We'll talk about that a little bit today. But I wanted to jump off uh, in the book of James, James chapter 1, verse 27. This is a a verse of Scripture I like to circle back to, but it says something uh, in here that I believe will give us an opportunity uh, to both lay a foundation and give us a launching point for the rest of uh, the message for the day. So let me just read this to you. James 1.27 says this, Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. Now, here's the thing. There's a couple of different directions you can go based on this particular verse. And yes, I do believe that God wants us to, in the purest form of following Him, to take care of those that are in need within our own community. Uh, But that's not the point of the message today. We want to focus in on the second part of this particular passage of Scripture where it says to keep oneself unstained from the world. And here's the thing about staining, being stained. We think about moral purity. No matter what we do, no matter where we go, whether we're actively engaged in what's going on in the world around us or not, as we go out into the world and as we live our lives, we're constantly being surrounded by the dirt and the grime of the world. And if we're not careful, that dirt and that grime, it gets on us. I think back to uh, in the uh, uh, Old uh, you know, Testament times and in the times of Christ, they used to always have uh, foot washing that would occur. It was a, a way that a host would kind of welcome you into uh, his uh, house, right? And the reason why is because when you were out walking in your sandals, no matter what you did, even if you tried your best to avoid all the puddles and the dirt and the grime in the streets, stuff would get on you. And so the washing uh, of the feet was to get all of that stuff uh, off of you. And here's the thing. You are going to be surrounded by the junk of the world. There's no way of escaping that. The only way, in fact, of escaping that is if you decide to go be a monk or a a nun or something like that and go live in some monastery uh, somewhere and extract yourself out of the world and live in a place like that unto God. But for all of us that are in this room, and I have had no conversation in all of my ministry where someone has talked to me sincerely about wanting to go and do something like that, for us, we have to learn 
how to live in the world. And, and one of the purest things that we can do uh, as we follow the Lord and try to practice our faith is to make every effort that we can to remain unstained. The issue is that the staining doesn't happen in the blatant immorality. Because how many of us, we equate these kinds of things like being pure. Well, well, I don't do those really bad things. Like I don't do that stuff over there and I don't do that stuff over there and I don't do that stuff over there. And so I'm good because I don't do all the big bad stuff. But that's not what staining, the process of staining that James is talking about here has nothing to do with that. I'm glad you don't do the big bad stuff. That wouldn't just be stained. That would be fully painted and covered and the whole deal. This is something that can happen, yes, yeah, subtly, slowly, without even being aware. And if we don't keep our guard up before long, we can find ourselves in a place that we really don't want to be. You know, Satan's, I think one of Satan's biggest tricks that he pulls on every single one of us is not that he tries to get us to do the big blatant obvious stuff it's that over time he tries to work with us gradually to slowly over time get you away from what it is that you know you should be doing and what is right before God it's that gradual process that eventually he knows will lead you away from your faith in Jesus and how many of us have been Christians long enough to recognize that we have been on a journey, a downward journey, a time or two where we have gotten further and further away from God and we didn't even know it until one moment happened where it was uh, made blatantly obvious to us and we recognize, whoa, how did I get here? Well, good that you were able to discover that because there are some that go on that journey and they never hit that moment and they never are corrected. Their course never changes and they never get directed back to the Lord. And how many of you understand that Satan doesn't want to do the obvious things because he knows that you'll say no? It's getting you to buy in to little compromises and little shifts and little things that he knows will eventually add up to what he's trying to get you to. How many of you have ever been around somebody who used to be running with you in the faith and they no longer profess a faith in Jesus? How did it happen? Did they just wake up one day? It may look like it, but did they just wake up one day and say, I don't believe in any of this anymore? They slowly went on a journey until their faith was eroded enough that they walked away from what it was that they had been called to. You guys know that I do furniture building and woodworking and stuff, and staining is a process in woodworking generally used to make a certain species of wood look like another species of wood. And so oftentimes you'll see they'll take a what's considered a secondary wood or an invaluable wood that really is not known for its beauty and it's usually cheaper wood and they'll take it and they'll stain it to change it and to make it look like something else so that by the appearance of it you may believe that it is another kind of wood. And likewise, this is what the enemy wants to do. He wants to take what is purely something that looks like this and convert it into something like this. And to take us away from our faith. And before we get into this, I just want to share a couple of things because as we talk about purity and as we talk about following the Lord in the purest sense in terms of our morality, one of the things that we need to recognize is that this is not a call into self-righteousness. As we begin to talk about purity and doing things according to God's laws, it becomes very easy that we start getting sucked into this place of self-righteousness where we are making this effort to constantly put on this outer appearance of doing what is right, and that is not at all what this is. This is about a heart and a soul, a, 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 a drive that comes from the heart and the soul where we desire to do what is right before God because we have a hunger and a desire to live for Him. 
And so there's this, this momentum that builds deep from within that says, I don't want the junk of the world anymore. I don't want the things that would uh, make me impure because I really want the things of God. And so I have this hunger to go after God and his purity and his righteousness because there is a desire that is welling up within me. So likewise, it's not something that we beat ourselves to do. It is not a, 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 an effort of the will necessarily. Because uh, it's not just trying to conform ourselves to some image because this is what the pastor said to me on Sunday morning. you got to get a hunger for God. And by that hunger and passion, you want to do what is right before Him. Because you want to please Him with your life. And you want to become more like Him. And you want to become less like the world. There's a drive that begins to stir in the heart and the soul of an individual who really loves Jesus. And all the things that God calls us to is not a matter of conformity or religion. It's a matter of your heart. And the reasons why we compromise and the reasons why we we get uh, uh, defiled by the world or we become unclean is because something is off in our heart, not necessarily the action. The action comes out of the heart. This is the teaching of Christ himself. And so we have to hunger for something. We have to hunger for not wanting to be stained. We gotta hunger for something of purity. And the end result of that, and this is the thing that we have to strive for, is not making ourselves more betterer, This is not about that. This is about getting closer to God. The more pure we are in our heart and our soul, and the less unstained we are by the world, the more we can know God because the less is in our way. The less becomes a, no, there's less that becomes a burden in our lives. There is less that corrupts our mind, our thinking, and our soul and our faith. And so we have more purity. And with more purity, there becomes more God. And with more God, this becomes a great cycle, doesn't it? That elevates us out of the garbage that we came out of. And if you don't believe you came out of the trash, I'm not looking at you specifically, sorry. (laughs) I hate that. I'll say things like that and I'll be locking eyes with somebody and I realize, I hope you don't think I think that way of you. But it's true of all of us. We've all come from the gutter. Now your gutter may be different than my gutter and we may have been found in a different pile of refuse somewhere, but the simple fact of the matter is all of us come out of that place and God wants to elevate us out of that place and give us a life that is beautiful and worth living and free from the burdens that we once found in that gutter. And if that isn't the gospel of Jesus Christ, I don't know what is. So the question is, can we really can we really live lives that are unstained by the world? Can this really be something that we can do? Because we start talking about being pure and making better moral decisions and we start talking about living this way and, and rejecting the ways of the world. That's a challenge. And that could be something that we look at and we begin to say, I don't know if I can really do that. Because I, you know your struggles. If you're honest enough with yourself, you know your own struggles. And so you begin to say to yourself, I don't know if I can do that because I'm really wrestling with some things here. And I don't want to make this sound like it's so light and easy. Now we'll get into how God comes along and helps. But what we need to recognize is that nothing we do as believers are just easy by nature. Because they go against being a Christian, living the Christian life, literally runs against the grain of what we know about life from the culture. And so anything that we do when we step out in faith 
It's called stepping out in faith because it means you have to do something. You don't know what the results are going to be in the end, and you just have to trust God that everything's going to turn out okay. And so I'm here to tell you, there is a process involved, but the simple answer is, can you do this? This is like Bob the Builder. Yes, we can. Come on, can you do it? Yes, we can. Nah, that was lame. You guys are too tired. I don't know what to tell you guys. Um, We can remain unstained. But I want to talk about the how this morning. I don't want to just build you up on great ideas and say, yeah, you could be unstained and this is how you do it, whatever. I want you to know this is what God has equipped us with so that we can walk this life out. And we can recalibrate our course when we start to get a little bit off. A lot of your life as a Christian is recalibration. It's why we have altar calls. It's why we come to church. It's why we go to Bible studies. It's why we spend time with other believers. It's because we need to be around some people who can see it before we see it because we're deceived so that other people can see it before and help us to recalibrate or that the word can be preached and we can be uh, quickened to the heart and decide that we need to make change. We need constant recalibration, which means you are constantly going to fail. And if, oh, my mom's like, daily. <laughs> okay, we're not, <laughs> this is like a bold profession, like, I do it every day. <laughs> and my dad's denying. She was talking about him. That's right, she's like, I was talking about him, I wasn't talking about me. All right, so anyways, there is a constant recalibration that needs to happen in our life because there is a constant, uh, you know, being made unclean, being made impure by the simple activities of our daily life. So this is not a, again, and I preach this, you've heard me say this before, but this is a journey, a process. This is not a, I'm either this way or I'm that way kind of a thing. And you have to accept the fact that remaining unstained, trying to be pure, is a process by which you are making the effort to recalibrate your life. So let me give you these four things I really want to get into today. If you were coming this morning in your lack of hours sleep, hoping that Pastor Brad would preach a short one, you should know better. The people who are laying in bed at home said, forget this. So the first thing is this, in terms of remaining pure and unstained, is that we have an example in Christ. 1 John chapter 3, verse 3 says this. He says, And everyone who thus hopes in Him purifies himself as what? As He is pure. Now here's the thing. Jesus was an example to us of a pure and spotless life. We understand and we recognize that Jesus did not sin. In fact, this is what Peter wrote about uh, Jesus in 1 Peter 2, chapter, 20, uh, or chapter 2, verse 21 and 22, where it says this, For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example, so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. And here's what he says, that Christ left us an example that we might actually follow in his footsteps. And what that really is talking about is that Jesus set an example in life, a worthy example, one that we can use to help us to recalibrate what it is that's going on in our lives. Because if our lives do not align with the sinlessness and the example of Jesus, then we have gotten off course. 
And so what we need to do is acquaint ourselves with the example of Jesus Christ. And the only way to acquaint yourself with the example of Jesus is one, is to get in the word of God so that you can uh, understand what that example was. And two, to live with Jesus actively involved and engaged in your life. Because there's two parts of this. There is the knowledge that we receive and the vision that we receive from the scripture, but there is the life that is breathed into that when we are walking with the Lord and God can engage us as a shepherd. And it is the shepherd who knows when the sheep are needing calibration. The shepherd takes his hook and he says, oh no, no, whoop, you're going the wrong way. But if our hearts are hardened and we are not softened before the Lord and God has no access to our heart or to the inward man, how can the shepherd lead us into green pastures when all we want to do is run to the thickets? Christ gave us an example. And here's something I think that you need to understand about the example that Christ gave to us. The example that Christ gave to us, he gave to us in the flesh. It says in the word of God that he emptied himself of all forms of godliness. And what that means is the life he lived, he didn't live it with the advantage of his godliness. He lived it with the advantages that we have, which is the Holy Spirit. And so if Jesus did it, What that means to us is that we can do it too. And here's the issue. When you just believe that God or Jesus did everything in the power of his godliness, then what example is that to you and I who are not God? Because at the end of the day, what that means is he had an unfair advantage. And we've got to try to live up to his example unfairly. And the call to be pure becomes an impossibility because the only way to purity is godliness. And so Jesus set an example in the very way that we have to live the example. And that's good news because it means that I can look at what he did and I can have hope that I can do it too. If Jesus didn't sin, I can have hope that I can break the sin that's in my life off and I can choose a better way. The second thing is this, is we've been called to sanctification. It's a big word. We'll get into it in a minute. This is what it says in 1 Thessalonians 4, 1-8. It says, Finally then, brothers, we ask and urge you in the Lord Jesus that as you receive from us how you ought to walk and to please God, just as you are doing, that you do uh, so more and more. For you know what instructions we gave to you through the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each one of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor, not in the passion of of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God, that no one transgress and wrong his brother in this manner, because the Lord is an avenger in all of these things. As we told you beforehand and solemnly warned you, for God has not called us for impurity, but in holiness. Therefore, whoever disregards this, disregards not man, but God who gives his Holy Spirit to you and the will of god is what it is your sanctification that is a huge big 10 cent word that literally means the process by which god makes you holy 
In other words, it's the process of cleaning that God has in your life. And what Paul, or, 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 or what Paul is urging uh, the believers in Thessalonica, what he's urging them is that not only would they uh, continue to purify themselves like they had, but they, they, they would do it all the more. In other words, they would make uh, their pursuit in life the sanctification that Christ wanted to bring to them. Because as he says later in the text, he says, we're not made for impurity. We're made for holiness. And holiness, if you guys remember, is the journey that we go on to try to make our lives look as most as they can, not just like Jesus, but like the righteousness that we have before God. And so what he, he's asking us to do and he's saying, look, don't be like the Gentiles. Don't pursue the things that they pursue. Because this is not what you've been created for. You've been created for holiness. And guess what? Here's the beautiful part. Is that God is responsible for the cleaning. Sanctification is a process by which he cleans us. But the, cle the cleaner has to have some uh, uh, um, uh, help from the one who's being cleaned. You ever try to put your kid in a bathtub that don't want to be in no bathtub? That becomes a real fun journey, don't it? And there's water and splashing and yelling and screaming. And some of you maybe don't have kids. You've got a dog that you try to give a bath every now and then to. And you're wrestling them in the bath or the shower or whatever it is. The simple fact of the matter is there has to be some compliance by the one who is being washed. And how many of you have ever washed that kid or washed that dog only to let them right up back outside and they go find a mud puddle right away? You see, this is the process. The process is that God will do His part. You have to do your part. And your part has to be a willingness and a surrender before the Lord so that God has access to be able to change you or, or, or yeah, to transform you, to clean you. And he'd also like your compliance in not going out and getting dirty again. Because we weren't created to be constantly cleaned up by God so that we can go out and get dirty again. Right. Now again, when we talk about un, what we're talking about today, being uh, uh, made clean, unclean, there's some things we can't help. And by nature, even the most clean person's going to have to take a shower every so often, right? Because just by living, there's a certain stank we get. And if you like to be around people, they don't want to smell you. But there's a difference between someone who needs an occasional bath to clean up from the dirt of whatever it is that they've been doing. There's a difference between that and there's a difference between the person who then immediately goes out and covers themselves in mud. And what God is looking for is a calling to a, a place of holiness and a place of purity because that's what we've been prepared for and that's why He cleans us so that we can continue to be holy and pure. The third thing is this. We have been equipped with godly wisdom. James chapter 3, 13 through 17 says this. Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder and every vile practice. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere." 
And the, 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 the thing that we need to understand that James is trying to get us to is when you function in your own wisdom, you will continually be led astray. And he actually turns the table. He says, who is wise and, 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 and smart, basically, amongst you? Let him be kind of the example of this. But here's the thing. It, it, it's kind of like he's flipping the tables because the person who stands up and says, I'm wise, yeah. Yeah. is most li- likely the dumb one. <laughs> right, and the judgy one. And he says, look, that kind of thing comes from the devil. It's demonic. And it may make sense in the world that there are people who uh, uh, operate and function full of themselves and what they think is right and what they say sounds good, but it has no basis in the truth of God. And people look to people for their wisdom all the time. But I have to tell you something, that the dumbest things I've done in my life, I did out of my own wisdom. Because it made sense to me at the time. It seemed right at the time. And in my own reasoning, and with my own wisdom, I made the choice to do something that later on I was like, why did I do something like that? Listen, have you guys ever been in a position where you go to make a decision, or you see something happening, and you think you've got the answer? Until someone throws a monkey wrench into what you're thinking, and they give you a totally different perspective that you never thought of before. How easy it is for us to think we know enough to make right decisions when we do not see clearly enough to know everything. But what he says is, look, don't lean on worldly wisdom. Don't lean on your own wisdom. He says, get wisdom from above because that wisdom that comes from God will lead you into the right places. And I've got to tell you something. One of the clearest and best ways of cleansing yourself and remaining unstained by the world is to function every day with the wisdom of the Lord. Because if God's wisdom is alive and it's active and it's breathing into you, it's truth. It's a, whole lot easy, or, or it's a whole lot harder to get deceived. And again, i got to tell you something. The way you get this wisdom isn't just from sitting around going, I know God. I go to church. I heard Pastor preach this weekend. I mean, I hope God imparts some wisdom through my mouth every week. You have to be in the Word of God so that His wisdom is alive in you. You have to hear from the Holy Spirit so He can breathe life into that Word and make it real. You have to know Jesus. Otherwise, you're not getting the wisdom of God. And you will continue to live in your wisdom which will take you continually to places where you will be stained by the world. Plain and simple. And lastly, this is it. If you want to remain unstained, we have to have a passion that is stoked by God's Word. You have to live passionately for the Lord. The moment you start to lose your passion for Jesus is the moment you'll begin to allow the ideas of the world to come in, to settle in, to begin to process, to begin to adopt, begin to adapt, to begin to uh, exercise in your own life. You have to stoke this fire of passion for the Lord. Listen to what it says in Psalm 119, 9 through 10. He says, how can a young man keep his way pure? And this is a legitimate question because there is folly in youth. Let me say that again. There's folly in youth. There's a lot of folly in old age too. Don't get me wrong. 
But when you're young, that's when you're trying to figure yourself out. It's try, where you're trying to understand who you are, what it is that you want out of life. And so a part of that process when you're young is that you go out and you do all kinds of dumb things. And hopefully you learn from those dumb things. And it begins to help you to narrow a little bit about who you are and help you understand those things. But there's a lot of folly in youth. And the psalmist is writing here because he recognizes God is calling us to a place of purity. But he looks and he says, how is a young person supposed to do this? Because he was a young person once. How many of all were young people once? How many of you look back and you're just like, man, I did some stupid things on the regular. So we ask the question, how can a young man keep his ways pure? How does a young person who is foolish by nature supposed to do this? Again, there's something in his writing where he believes that because he's older, he's figured it out. Which in some ways is a little bit of a deception that he has in his own heart maybe, I guess. And this is what he says. By guarding it, according to your word with my whole heart i seek you let me not wander from your commandments and here is the truth in order to get to a place where your whole heart seeks after the lord and let me tell you something it's when your whole heart seeks after the lord that you excel at purity that you excel at that recalibration we were talking about. That you excel after living the example of Christ. When you literally have your whole heart engaged, that's how you get to that place. But in order to have your whole heart really fully engaged in what God is calling you into, and to be able to have that passion and that desire for God, you have to invest yourself into His Word into knowing what the commands are, into understanding what God has already laid out for us and told us is true and good and right. One of the issues in the church today is that the church is illiterate. And you might not like me saying that, but the truth of the matter is, when you talk to the average Christian, they can barely show up to church three or four times a month, much less that they ever spend time opening the Word of God, sitting before the Lord, reading it, letting it permeate their hearts, and absorbing what God has to say. And so most believers don't even know what the Word of God has to say. How are you supposed to stoke a fire in your heart for the Lord and be wholehearted to Him if you're not opening the Word of God and receiving His wisdom, His knowledge, His understanding, His truth on a daily basis? How are you supposed to do that? And this is not forcing yourself into some discipline like eating your vegetables. If you have a hunger for God... You want to read His Word. You want to know what He has to say. You want to get to know Him. It's not a burden. It's a joy because it's coming out of your heart again. All of this comes down to the heart and the inner man. And if you have to force yourself to somehow love God, then I think you're doing it wrong. Now this doesn't mean there are times when you've just got to push through. There are times when your heart isn't feeling it and you're struggling. It's kind of like uh, for those of you who've ever worked out or whatever, there's just those days you wake up and you're like, I do not want to go to the gym today. I just want to stay in bed. I want to relax. I want to do something else. But if you've ever been in that situation and you pushed yourself and you forced yourself and you said, I'm not giving in, and you went and you did the workout, you probably walked away feeling like it was the best work out of your life. So there are times, listen, I don't want you to mishear me, there are times when you have to push yourself, and it has to maybe rest on the fact that it is a discipline. But you should have a hunger for this. 
if you're wholeheartedly pursuing the Lord. And here's the beautiful thing. It becomes this beautiful cycle. You invest into it. It invests into you. Your hunger, your passion increases. Then you, you want to do more. And then the more produces more hunger and passion. And you get on this cycle, this journey of depth with the Lord. These things need to be present in our life if we're to continue to remain unstained. Otherwise, we are susceptible to the schemes of the devil. So here's today's takeaways as we wrap up. Moral compromise and self-satisfaction will only ever lead us to become something that we are not. So we have to be at war with moral compromise and our own self-righteousness and self-satisfaction. Otherwise, we deceive ourselves. Second thing is this. God calls us to be pure, to not get stained by the world, but to live lives of holiness. This is not some optional thing that Pastor Brad is talking about. This is not a, well, if I ever get around to it, I'll work on that. This is what you've been called to. A lot of what's written in the New Testament, especially in the letters that we find in the New Testament that were written by the apostles, there is instruction after instruction after instruction that we as believers don't live like the world. We choose to live lives of holiness. This is what you've been called to. And, and we read it just before, to lives of sanctification. And the third thing is this. We need to take responsibility every day for the spiritual and mental cleaning that needs to occur to wash all the junk of life off of us. And then we need to recognize that there is a God in heaven who specializes in our cleanliness. You can make a portion of this is your effort, a portion of it is his effort. But at the end of the day, we are made clean, pure, and holy by the blood of Jesus. And we need to lean into that every day. Amen? Amen. We're going to close with a word of prayer. And we'll have the prayer team come on up. And look, I know it's a... Sunday morning where we're all a little bit tired, but today is a beautiful day to get yourself on track with the Lord. So I'm going to put the altar call out there again this morning. If you don't know Jesus as your Savior, you can come forward, you can receive salvation, forgiveness, and a promise of eternity with Him today. And you can know that you know that you know that you are saved. If you've been on a journey lately where you've been struggling in your faith and you're not really living according to what we're talking about, you've allowed the world to stain you, you can come forward today and you can get yourself on the right track. You can recalibrate and get yourself in the right place with the Lord. And so I would invite you to come forward and deal with that this morning. The prayer team members would love to pray over you uh, in that situation. If you need prayer for anything else, if there's something in this that convicted you this morning and you just want to do do business with the Lord before you walk out of here, please come forward and do that. If there's things going on in your life right now where you just need the intervention of the Lord, please come forward. We've got some people that will pray over you. They'll intervene on your behalf. And you can receive the help of the Lord before you walk out of these doors today. Would you guys pray with me? Lord, we come to you this morning. And Lord, we recognize we've been called to a place of holiness. We also recognize that our sinful nature constantly draws us away from that. And Lord, as believers, we want to live a life as you have called us to holiness, to cleanliness, to being unstained. So Lord, help us In our pursuit, Lord, we recognize that you clean every single one of us. We come before you and your cross and we lay the things of our uncleanliness before you, God. 
recognizing and understanding, Lord, that you will clean us. But Lord, we also pray for the strength as we go about our daily lives and as we encounter the dirt that just happens in life. We pray, Lord, that we would have the wherewithal to not give in, to not be seduced, to not be drawn in and away from things uh, that would retain our holiness before you. And God, we just pray this morning for those who would come forward and receive ministry up at the altar. We pray, Lord, that you would just begin to do a work in their life. And so we pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.